Uh, I wanted to hear about uh, something other than that, chosen by God. I thought that's an idea that we got over as the people of God, right? It, Jonathan Edwards was into that, and um, this is a new millennium. Why would someone of that caliber, whom I respected, fly from Florida to Scottsdale, Arizona, to talk about an idea that's past its sell-by date? We got over this. I wanted to hear him. But I didn't want to hear him on that. And so I was in two minds whether I'd go. It was a Friday night meeting and a Saturday morning meeting. And I thought, I'll go. No, I won't. I'll go. No, I don't want to go. I'll go. Well, I decided to go. But I sat on the back row because I thought the moment this man, whom I do respect, starts quoting all these theologians, some of the greats of church history, I'm out of here. I, I, I'm not really interested. That's my thought. Now, if I sit on the back row, I'm not going to disrupt the event. Well, I went to the event, and if you've ever experienced a Ligonier Ministries meeting, it's full of God's Word. It's full of God's people. I was surprised that 70% of the people attending were men. That took me by surprise. I'm not sure I fully grasp all of the reasons why that was the case, but that, that got my attention. And Dr. R.C. Sproul came out, and all he did was go to God's Word and uh, teach from the Bible, and I could uh, listen to him without exasperation. And I was challenged by what he said, but I thought, but I've got other verses that would dismiss his arguments, and uh, it's going to fall apart when um, I could ever ask him a question. Well, then he announced the fact, and I saw it in the program, they were gonna be, there was going to be a question and answer time. A question and answer time, I thought, well, that's when this idea of his is going to fall apart. It's going to be exposed when we ask just simple questions, like what about John 3.16? What about 2 Peter 3.9? Well, the funny part was that's what got me to come back in the morning because that's when the question and answer session was. And I thought, I've, I've got a few questions, but I'm sure others have too. And what happened was Dr. R.C. Sproul came out, sat in a chair, and a moderator had a microphone and just looked at some of the questions, and before we got to the first question, Dr. Sproul said, now, let me anticipate what the first question is. It's either, what about John 3.16, or what about 2 Peter 3.9? And uh, I thought, yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's good. That is, the, those are the, the, the questions. God is not willing that any should perish, right? But all come to repentance. Well, what happened was he handled those two texts in the space of about three or four minutes. And if you could have seen me, if a camera was on me, you'd have noticed my face went deathly white because I realized I was in trouble. In two minutes, just expounding John 3.16, a verse I could quote in my sleep, I think, he showed me how shallow my understanding was, my assumptions that I brought to the text, what the text actually said. And rather than being happy about this, I realized I was in trouble. My traditions, not his, were being exposed. He'd brought forth scriptures that plainly taught the sovereignty of God in salvation. But I thought I had verses that would negate it and negate all that he was saying. But he dealt with the biggest and the best questions out there, happily, relaxed, and going to the text and saying, let's see what it actually says. I ended up writing a book about that experience because I did have a number of objections and I wrote a book called 12 Whatabouts, answering the common objections to divine sovereignty. And I really recounted my journey into the scriptures to see what they actually taught. But it started, and in fact, that the whole weekend was an amazement to me, but I realized I owed it to myself to study this. I didn't want to preach it yet. I wasn't embracing it yet, but I knew I needed to study this. And here's what I found. Most people are not open to study. Most people that are so caught up in a system of man-made thinking think that there's no reason for them to study. Why would I study a verse I can quote? John 3.16. I know it. Well, there's a reason to study because we often bring our own traditions to the text and let's see what it actually says. And so it started a period of about six to nine months where I ordered everything I could of Dr. Sproul 
uh, on the subject of uh, predestination and sovereignty and was amazed what I found. I then began to run across other authors as well. James Montgomery Boyce was one. Dr. James White was another. Very soon after this, uh, Dr. James White came out with the book, The Potter's Freedom, which was tremendous exegetically to get into the scriptures to see what they were saying. And with the thinking of Sproul and the exegetical insights of Dr. White, I came out of that, what I call a theological cocoon, uh, as someone who embraced the doctrines of grace, if you know what that means, the, the tulip of the Reformed faith, T-U-L-I-P. And uh, it was as if Dr. Sproul had thrown a large rock called God's sovereignty into my theological pond, unknowingly. He just came and taught. But he set in motion a series of events whereby that rock, embracing it, understanding that God is sovereign, had huge ramifications. And I continue to see those ramifications as the ripple effects of that rock coming into the water makes its way to the shore. And that's what happened in my life. I realized God is sovereign in the era of salvation. And then I realized he's sovereign over this aspect of the church and that aspect of our understanding on uh, this theological issue. Or I began to see that the, 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 the roof uh, of God's sovereignty was over all of the house so to speak, that God is sovereign over all things. Well, aren't we going to go to the Scripture? Yeah, I'm just setting us up. We're, 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 we're going to go to the Scripture. I became a, a TBN host before all this. I was a, I, I said to people, it doesn't get lower now as uh, to say I was someone who asked people to call the number on the screen. Live television shows here in Arizona that, I spanned two hours. Oftentimes, the last guest didn't show up, and I'd be on the spot asked to preach for 30 minutes and just ran with it. It's an amazing experience. I was so into this, believing I was helping people. I look back and wince because God, by the Holy Spirit, sent Dr. Sproul through the means of uh, him coming and a flyer that told me of the event, and it started a process that has brought me to where I am today in my understanding of God, the true God who reigns, who rules, who lives. He really is active in his sovereignty in all things. So important we grasp this. And here's what I understood. We read 2 Timothy chapter 3. It tells us about the last days. And in fact, I want to go there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. It tells us about God and about deception. And it says that in the last days there will be deception and deceivers. And having the experience of meeting some of these uh, very well-known figures, had a meal with Jesse Duplantis. He's another well-known proponent of the word of faith. Knew these guys a little bit. Do they really believe what they're saying? I think they do. But here's what I came to understand. Deceived people deceive people. There are some that are absolute sharks. They're in it for all the wrong reasons. But 2 Timothy 3 and 4 tell us that it's not just the preachers who are wrongly motivated. Their hearers are as well. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 13 tells us, But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Do you hear that? They deceive themselves and they deceive others with their teaching, but they really believe the deception. You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them and that from childhood you've known the sacred writings, that's the scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you, this is chapter 4, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, 
Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now hear this. <clears throat> For the time will come will, when they will not endure. They'll not put up with sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Did you hear what was written here? Did you hear what was said? Not only are they're going to be uh, teachers who are deceived, who deceive others, but they're going to be people who will want to hear the deception. They will want to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves their own favorite teachers. I'm putting in the word favorite, but it's really an, an implication. They'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. I want someone who's going to show me how to get ahead financially. I want someone who's going to Teach me the laws that will get myself healed. I'm going to be free from this sickness. I, I, I want that. I, I, I want that with all my heart. Jesus said he came to give me life and life more abundantly. There it is. Yeah, he did. He didn't say he came to give you lifestyle. He came to give you life. And it's both the preacher and the people that hear that say, I want the hundred dollar, uh, excuse me, the hundred fold return. If I give $1,000, I can just be looking for the $100,000 that's going to come because I give. I need Brother Big Shot, and Brother Big Shot needs me. And if, if, have you ever noticed these guys? They, they never get on the TV and say, this works, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to sow my million dollars into uh, uh, this particular charity work or this work in Mexico. No, it's, other, it's Brother Big Shot giving to Brother Big Shot over the road in the same town or across the state. And uh, they never tell you to give to someone else and get the hundredfold return. It's to them. Self-serving, it really is. Deceived people, deceived people. Here's what we're talking about. In the charismatic sector of the church, there is this thing called the word of faith. Not everyone who's a charismatic embraces word of faith doctrine. But that's the seed bed where this thing springs. And the word of faith is the idea, as I say, that you can have everything that is promised in the Bible now. But the Bible itself tells us about God's sovereignty, and it does not teach that we'll have every blessing of the kingdom this side of glory, that we'll always live to be 120 years old that will live free from sickness and disease. We're in a fallen world, and many have been born with terrible issues physically. And for some, their healing is going to be when they see Jesus face to face. There won't be sickness in heaven, and Jesus has paid for that healing. If I could summarize the word of faith doctrine, hear this, and you'll understand we're talking about a God that's different from the God of the Bible. I wrote this a long time ago in a garden far, far away. The God of the word of faith made man in his image and gave him two special gifts. The first of these was something called dominion. This newly created being formed out of the dust of the ground was made the God of this world, supreme Lord over all he surveyed. This gift of dominion meant that man ruled over his circumstances, everything in his environment, including the weather, was now subject to him. The second gift God gave him was seed for sowing. This came in two forms. The first type of seed given to him would be sown into the ground, producing crops of every imaginable kind. Man could determine the type and quantity of the crop he would have. He could have as much or as little as he wished. This second type of seed took the form of faith-filled words. Faith-filled words dominate reality. Like his creator before him, man could speak, and everything he said would come to pass. He could have whatever he said. In fact, 
He not only could have, he would have, all that came out of his mouth. Everything on planet Earth was subject to man. Nothing was beyond his control, and he exerted that control through the use of his words. Death and life being in the power of the tongue. No lack or sickness or poverty could continue to exist once man had spoken in faith. If there ever was lack, man could speak abundance and everything would conform. All created things, all, created, all creation itself, awaited man's faith-filled words to see what would be said. The seed of his words would come to fruition. God was hoping that man would decide to speak words of life rather than death. Oh, how he hoped for that. In this way, all would be well, all would be good. But something happened that meant disaster for God and his plan. Man listened to the serpent and liked what he heard. He decided to get in league with the crafty snake, and instead of choosing words that would bring life, health, prosperity, and blessing, he chose the way of death. The curse of death now reigned. Sickness and poverty would gain the upper hand. If we could imagine a father giving a new car to a son as a gift, so God, having given man the keys to his car, planet Earth, he could only watch in horror as man drove the car at full speed into the ditch. The first man, Adam, failed to use his dominion wisely. In obeying the serpent, Adam and his race had handed over the planet's keys to the devil. The devil, not God, was now in charge, the ruling God of this world. There was now nothing God could do. His hands were tied. All he could do was hope. Hopefully, yes, just hopefully, another man would arise who would make good decisions and restore dominion back to mankind. That was God's hope anyway, in something called the plan of redemption. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not the God of the Bible. That's heretical. It's based on some truth, which all heresy is. Truth taken to an extreme. See, no one among us would believe something that had no basis in reality. But if the one dispensing heresy can put some truth in there, like a good and wholesome sandwich, just a little bit of poison. He can include healthy meat with just enough poison and it becomes a lethal meal for anyone who partakes of it. What I've just read to you is heresy of a most pernicious and damnable kind. Second Peter 2 tells us that there are damnable heresies to Dismiss the sovereignty of God as an attack on truth. That's heretical. That, that's big league stuff we're dealing with. It's error of the worst kind. That's what's taught in the Word of Faith movement. Behind the words of the preacher, there's a hissing serpent spewing out damnable lies about God, about man, and the nature of reality. These lies are damnable for the simple reason that if they believe, they damn the human soul forever. Yet the serpent dispenses his lies with just enough truth to deceive his prey. One of the lies is the fact that you can become a god, little g, because Jesus taught that, right? Well, I need to understand that and... Uh, before I lay the groundwork for that, let me do what I promised. What kept me in when I began to understand these things and be hesitant about some of the things that I was hearing, uh, some of the strange things that came from these men's mouths, particularly Kenneth Copeland. I remember coming to the States and asked a pastor in the movement, what do you think of Copeland's view on what happened between the cross and the resurrection. He's got some uh, blasphemous things that he teaches. Well, the pastor actually said this, and it surprised me. In fact, it shocked me. He said, oh, he's just a jerk in that area. And what I thought was amazing was, here was someone in the movement who didn't hold to everything Copeland said. And here's where people on the outside 
need to grasp hold of something. Not everyone in the movement believes everything that Brother Big Shot or Sister Satellite says. And that allowed me to stay because I thought, I don't agree with him there. I don't agree with that. He said this back in 1982. Okay, well, I don't agree with that. But I still maintained the basic premise of the movement that if we work the laws that God has given, we can have what we say. Great lies are built on some truth. There's a wooden understanding of uh, scriptures that say death and life is in the power of the tongue, and they take that to the point where we can speak words that bring death to our bodies. If you say, um, I'm catching a cold, you've just let the devil in. He has now the ability to bring the cold. And so that's what's going on when someone dies. What have we said in the way of death that has brought death? It couldn't have had the fruit of death unless there was the seed of death by the things that we've said. Now here's a right understanding of that verse. I believe death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death in our relationships. There are many relationships that are dead because of words that have been spoken. Uh, death is, is, is spoken of, but not in a literal sense. Again, why am I getting that? from that scripture because I'm seeing God's sovereignty in all things for 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 me to say I'm catching a cold that allows the devil to give me a cold or I'm dying to see you that allows cancer to come because I've just said I'm dying and it's as if the spiritual realm is awakened oh now we can bring death to this man because he's said I'm dying do you see the bondage of that you see, the appeal of that is I can stop saying those words and start speaking life. Um, I'm catching a healing. How are you doing? I'm blessed. I'm catching a healing. All these words that we used to say in the Word of Faith movement. Thank God I'm delivered from that bondage. And God is not 